The fact that transition metals often exist as positive cations, while electrons, which are often found as lone pairs in organic compounds, are negative, means that the two can get together to form what are called coordination compounds. A coordination compound includes a central metal ion or atom, such as Ni2+, surrounded by a set of molecules or ions that are bonded to the central metal atom through what are called coordinate covalent bonds. What's unique about a coordinate covalent bond is that both electrons of the covalent bond are donated by the same atom. So electron sharing is still going on. It's just that we think of both electrons in the bond as coming from the non-metal partner. A great example of a transition metal coordination complex is the hexa-aqua nickel-2 ion, which contains a central nickel-2 plus cation surrounded by six water molecules. And this has the octahedral geometry. So these two waters are actually pointing out towards you. This water that I'm drawing, as well as this one here, are both pointing away from you, and we often use dashed lines like this to represent that, while these two waters above and below are just pointing straight up and down in the plane of the screen. The entire, what's called complex, the entire metal complex, has a charge of plus two. And we think of each of the bonds within the coordination complex between the non-metal, in this case oxygen, and the metal, the nickel, as involving a pair of electrons from the non-metal atom. So you'll often see these drawn with arrows pointing to the metal atom, indicating that both electrons are coming from the non-metal atom. This particular complex is pretty famous for appearing green. So when nickel-2 finds itself in aqueous solution, for example, we end up with a green solution. Coordination compounds are a fairly unique class of compound because this sphere of groups that surrounds the central metal atom has a big impact on the properties of the metal and the properties of the compound overall. So we can tune this outer sphere of molecules and we can tune the central metal atom to achieve a variety of properties. Color is one of those properties, but coordination compounds also exhibit unique reactivity, often as Lewis acids. To begin exploring the properties of coordination compounds in more detail, though, we need to define some terminology. The molecules or ions that surround the central metal atom are known as ligands. And ligands are usually small or moderately sized organic molecules. Not all of the atoms within the ligands are actually bonded to the metal. We define the specific atom that donates a lone pair in a coordination compound as the ligand donor atom. So for example, in the nickel-2 hexa-aqua complex that we looked at previously, the oxygen atom is what's actually donating a lone pair to the metal. So if we were to draw out the lone pairs explicitly, one of the oxygen lone pairs is actually not involved in coordinate covalent bonding, while the other is. And you should notice that we've kind of turned some of the water molecules around so that the ligand donor atom is drawn as directly bonded to the metal. This helps us clarify which atom within the ligand is actually bound to the metal. Since a coordinate covalent bond involves the donation of two electrons from the same atom, it makes sense in this case that oxygen, the only atom within water that bears lone pairs, serves as the ligand donor atom. It will sometimes be the case that a ligand contains multiple atoms bearing lone pairs, and only one of those atoms actually can serve as a ligand donor atom. Another situation that's worth appreciating, and something we'll come back to later, is that some ligands include multiple atoms that can serve as donors, and that actually do serve as donors. So a, a great example, and one that we'll work with a little bit later, is ethylene diamine, which contains two nitrogens with Lewis basic lone pairs that can both serve as donors to the same metal center. This is what's known as a chelating or polydentate ligand. The concept of a coordinate covalent bond and the idea of a Lewis acid base reaction or interaction go hand in hand. So it's worth appreciating that the formation of a coordination compound is a Lewis acid base process in which a Lewis acidic metal cation combines with a Lewis basic ligand, which may be neutral or negative, but which must bear a lone pair or a pair of electrons that can be donated more generally, to form a coordinate covalent bond in which the new bond is composed of two electrons from the Lewis base, in this case L, and those are donated to the Lewis acid, in this case, M, and the overall charge remains at plus one in this case, since the ligand 
was neutral. So we can see that the Lewis base has donated a pair of electrons to the Lewis acid to form the resulting complex. The Lewis acid will always be accompanied by some counterion. Usually it's something that's not very basic, something like chloride or sulfate, something fairly innocuous. In that case, X minus comes along for the ride and is considered part of the coordination compound, but we put the complex in brackets to distinguish between the ligands that are actually covalently bonded, coordinately covalently bonded to the metal, and the counter ions which just balance the charge on the complex. Another way to state this same point is that many coordination compounds are salts. This means that the complex part the part containing the metal ion and the ligands that are coordinately covalently bonded to it has a charge. That charge is counterbalanced by the counter ions. But very often those counter ions at least theoretically have lone pairs, right? If we think about sulfate, for example, sulfate has tons of lone pairs within its Lewis structure that could, in theory, be used to form co coordinate covalent bonds with a metal center, right? Any of these two singly bonded oxygens with negative charge are just ripe to donate electrons to a metal center in theory. Because of that possibility, we want to take care to distinguish what's actually bonded to the metal and what's not. And that's why we use brackets to do this. So square brackets enclose everything including the metal center and the ligands that are actually coordinately covalently bonded to it. Another important point here is that the sulfate ion in this case is not a ligand it's a counter ion. It just balances the charge of the complex and engages in an ionic bond with the entire nickel H206 2 plus cation. As we've talked about in many different contexts before, here as always it's important to be able to look at the formula and be able to separate this into its component ions. SO4 2 minus and in this case the newcomer nickel H206 2 plus. Because ligands are often neutral and metals are often positive, we do often see that the coordination complex itself is positive, but this is by no means required. For example, here's an anionic complex containing three potassium ions. This is just K+, and one copy of the FeCn6 ion, which includes iron, six cyanide ligands, and an overall charge of minus three, to balance the three K pluses within the formula. Ultimately, we can unpack this hexacyano ion even further to notice that since C and minus is itself negatively charged, six of them amount to negative six charge overall, and the iron cation here has the oxidation state of plus three or Fe three plus. You'll want to be able to decompose a complex like this into its component ions so that you can tell the oxidation state of the metal center, which is often key, and which species are actually ligands versus mere counter ions. That's especially important in cationic complexes where the counter ion is going to look a lot like a ligand and in some cases can serve as a ligand when other metal centers or other ligand sets are involved. One important characteristic of coordination compounds that plays a big role in their properties is the coordination number. And we want to define the coordination number very specifically. It's not necessarily just the number of ligands around the metal center because a single ligand may have multiple binding points. We define the coordination number very specifically as the number of ligand donor atoms in the metal complex. So for example, the complex silver NH32 with a plus one charge has two ammonia ligands bonded to a central silver cation for a coordination number of two. Nickel CN4 2 minus has a coordination number of four since four cyano ligands surround the central nickel cation. The hexaquo cation such as the chromium version with six waters surrounding the central metal atom in this case having a charge of two plus overall has a coordination number of six as evidenced by the six waters within the formula for the complex. Looking at these three examples, you may believe that the number of ligands within the complex formula tells you the coordination number directly. However, that's not the case. The reason is ligands can have multiple binding points. So for example, the similar looking complex CR ethylene diamine 3 2 plus appears to have a coordination number of 3, 
but in fact, ethylene diamine is a bidentate ligand. That is, it has two binding points on it. And so, rather than three, the coordination number here is six. And in fact, structurally, this red complex has a lot in common with the hexa-aqua complex right above. A table in your text has other examples of coordination complexes and their associated coordination numbers. Do keep in mind that ligands with multiple binding points are going to complicate assignment of the coordination number. We define coordination number as the number of ligand donor atoms, and that sometimes requires us to think about the number of binding points in the ligand or a finer examination of the structure of the complex rather than just its formula.